Hi, Michelle English, and on behalf of the MIT Center for International Studies, welcome you to today's STAR Forum. We'll be screening Where Powers Live, a film that chronicles the lives of indigenous faith believers in Nigeria and the discriminatory attitudes they face. Immediately following the screening, you'll hear from Shola Lawal, who is the writer, producer, and director of the film. Ms. Lawal is a Nigerian journalist and the recipient of the 2019 International Women's Media Foundation's Elizabeth Neufer Fellowship. The fellowship brought her to MIT as a research associate at the MIT Center for International Studies and provides journalism residencies at the Boston Globe and the New York Times. She reports on issues of humanity and injustice, including the women's rights movement in Nigeria, migrants in Libya, forced reserves in Ghana, political upheaval in Togo, the Boko Haram conflict, and the migrant crisis in Mexico and the U.S. Today's event is co-sponsored with the MIT Africa Forum. It's also listed as an IEP offering, which requires us to collect um, attendance on MIT students. Um, before we start the film screening, I wanted to invite Ari Jacobovitz to discuss. He's the manager of the MIT Africa Forum, and he can tell us a little bit about that. Hi everyone, uh, it's a privilege to be here, thank you. Um, I'm Ari, I run, I'm the managing director of the MIT Africa program, and uh, we run a speaker series called the MIT Africa Forum, which normally happens during the academic semester. Uh, we feature speakers from basically on any topic related to Africa. Our most recent one was a startup showcase uh, featuring MIT students who are launching startups in Africa. We've had previous heads of state. We've had the former president, or the current president of Sierra Leone speak. He was here in March. Um, we've had numerous academics. Um, so if you're interested in joining that mailing list, come and speak to me, and I will very gladly add you. Um, so as part of the MIT Africa program, there are students that travel to various countries in Africa through the MISTI program, which is part of the Center for International Studies here, which is my main work. So at this very moment, uh, there are about 60 students, 60 MIT students, uh, working on various things all across Africa. None of them are in Nigeria, unless they went without telling me um, that I know. But we have many in West Africa and Ghana and Sierra Leone doing various things. So we have a, a growingly vibrant program in Africa that really serves to educate students on sort of the nature of modern day Africa and what it means to be working there and how to engage. Um, so. Very happy to be here. I'm very excited to see the film. Uh, if you have any questions about the program, if you're a student or you're just curious about it, um, happy to chat afterwards too. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much for coming out, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you to Michelle and um, Center for International Studies for this privilege. Um, like I wrote in the US Biosum guide that you have, it was quite a stumble trying to make this film because I, I wasn't expecting the work that goes into making an independent documentary, and it was my first. And so I lost footage quite a bit. I, I lost time working on it. I mean, it took me about 200 years to film it. Um, <laughs> I started filming in 2018, and by 2019, I still wasn't um, anywhere. So. Last year, I just had to ask myself um, a simple question. Why did you do this in the first place? And for me, there was a, a point where um, the chief priest was talking. And that, for me, was the highlight of the whole film. My whole purpose for this film was to send a message and to just to let people know um, what we're doing to ourselves. Because I grew up in Nigeria where um, we would watch Nollywood movies a lot, and Nollywood is like the, like the Hollywood equivalent of Nigeria, um, and there's lots of good movies there. But Nollywood also taught me that it was okay to make fun of people who were um, practicing Yoruba religion or like um, demean them, or you know, it gave me this picture of like anybody who's practicing Yoruba religion is like always an 
old woman or an old man that wants to wreak havoc on people's lives, wants to tear families apart. And, and I encountered this lady and she, she just, you know, she kind of like shook my whole perception of that. And that was very interesting for me and I thought everybody else had to see it. Um, and so that message kept bringing me back and kind of propelled me to finish it up. And when I was finishing, I thought, well, at least I'm doing something for the minorities, um, like, I mean, the 2% of people who are still um, practicing different traditional religions, not just Yoruba religion, across Nigeria. And just a bit of history here. Uh, when the colonialists came, um, what is now present day Nigeria, what is now present day Nigeria was um, everybody had uh, their own different tribes and um, ethnicities, and they all had their different deities. And so when the colonialists came, they just like cut up this part that is now called Nigeria. And, you know, everybody, you know, we started following these different religions, but there's still people who practice, um, you know, their ancestral religions or spiritualities. And uh, they're, they're now about 2%. I mean, Muslims, Christians in Nigeria, about 48%. And it's just about 2%. And I, I thought, well, this could go a long way um, in trying to, I don't know, just get people to think differently about how we see them. I mean, I'm hoping that this really doesn't, I mean, I, I made this film and I'm happy. For me, it was kind of like a failure. Um, and I thought to myself, it could be better. It could, of course, it's not Oscar winning material, but it could be better. It could, it could have more footage. It could be longer. It could be this, it could be that. But at the end of the day, it exists. And I, I told to my, myself at that point, well, if you're failing, at least fail forward. And I mean, if an MIT screening is failing, then <laughs> I'll have more of that. Um, but I, I'm hoping that now, like when I finished this film, I had a different um, message I wanted to pass. But now, having reported from the US-Mexico border, I'm really hoping that people receive it as not just like, um, a message to, they receive it as something bigger than religion or religious discrimination. They receive it um, in a way that helps us think about how we treat people who we think are different from us. Um, when I was coming to the US for this fellowship, I had heard about Africans traveling to um, Latin America to get to the US. And I thought, well, I have to see that for myself. Um, and so, of course, I went to Tijuana. Um, I went to Tapachula, rather, on the border with Guatemala. That's like the southernmost part of Mexico. And there, I met some 3,000, 4,000 Africans just um, waiting to be attended to by uh, the Mexican immigration authorities. See, they had been held there for six months when I got there. And most of them, of course, they sold everything they had to get to um, South America. And by then, six months in, they had no funds. So lots of people were living in tents um, outside the immigration center. And when I got there, you know, I mean, I already knew that I was going to speak to people, write a story. But then when I got there and I mean, and I saw children, just like the number of children that were living in tents with their parents, that shook me to the core. And I remember this woman particularly, she was holding, um, so you can see, sorry, we cropped that out, but that's the baby she's cradling in her arms and he's five days old. And she looked at me and she said, he hasn't had a single vaccine shot in five days. And um, that was incredibly hard. Um, I mean, the whole reason that Mexico is holding them is because of this agreement that was made in July, last July, with um, President Trump to cut down the numbers of migrants who are um, coming in through Mexico. And so the containment strategy for Mexico was to just hold them well before it would give them exit permits to get to the US um, just to travel through. Um, by July, it started giving them exit permits that said they could only um, leave the country through the south. So basically back to Guatemala where they were coming from. I mean, nobody was going to take that. And um, when I got there in November, they had been protesting, um, you know, for the Mexican governments to free them. 
And finally, the Mex Mexico started um, processing these permanent residency cards. See, it was a way for, it was an easy way for Mexico to get out of the deal by not totally getting out of it. So it gave them um, permanent residency status so that they could move freely in the country. I mean, you even have the right, you have every citizenship benefit if you're a permanent res resident in Mexico, but you, you can't vote, that's the only thing. And so it gave them those cards and at least it got them to Tijuana. But I mean, if US has anything to say about it, of course Mexico would just be like, uh, well, I, I just, I, I don't know about that, right? Um, so by the time I got there in November, people see this family, they just got theirs. They were the first family to get theirs. And so they were really happy to at least be able to move. Um, and yeah, they would always come to this um, immigration center to queue. Like it was really slow, the process. Of course, um, Mexicans speak Spanish and most Africans come in, uh, speak Portuguese, um, English, um, French. And so there was always confusion at the center and there was always clashes. And I remember there was a clash and um, the uh, Mexican military, they had already like assembled themselves. You can see the migrants over here. And I just remember seeing this little boy. I mean, he, he, anyways, this stuck with me and then I took the picture. And this is the tent, um, tent, little tent village where they were living in. And I say they were now because most of them have now moved to um, Tijuana because they have those permanent residency cards. Um, but where are they coming from anyways? Um, most of them are from the Congo and Cameroon, both countries currently in conflict. Um, of course, thanks to colonialism again, um, um, Cameroon is um, an English and French speaking country and um, the French is the majority um, and the French government, well, the English speakers have been accusing the French government of oppression for years now. And when nothing was done about it, they started protesting in 2017 and that protest was um, met with like brutal force from the military. So a lot of the um, men from Cameroon, the women from Cameroon that I met there were professionals. They were teachers, doctors, um, just hanging around, you know, languishing in Mexico. There's also, of course, another um, conflict, the one that you're probably most familiar with, which is the um, Boko Haram conflict in <coughs> Nigeria. Um, I mean, there was lots of factors that could have contributed to, that contributed to um, the insurgency, the rise of the insurgency in 2009. And again, um, thanks to the colonialists, because I just like to um, blame them, but I, I, mean, I mean, when they came to West Africa, um, the resources that they needed to take out of the continent were concentrated in the South. And so lots of development and infrastructure went there. And so that meant that there was, um, an unequal development between the north and the southern parts of most countries. It's, it's like that, you know, there's a line and you can see that. Ghana, is Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, Benin, it's like that. The development in the south and, and the north is not equal. And um, of course, the Nigerian government has a big role to play in that as well. Um, there was, there's so much poverty in the north. Um, there's an absence of education, healthcare, and just general prosperity. Corruption as well contributes to that. And of course, th this group kind of grew in those margins and tried to fill those gaps. Um, and now um, the humanitarian fallout is that 35,000 people have died and that's probably a gross underestimation um, because local authorities say about 100,000 people have died since 2009. Uh, Two million people are displaced. Um, also, the jihadi threat is growing every year. Um, Boko Haram split into 2016 um, into two groups, one backed by um, ISIS Central, and now they hold a position that is strategic in the Lake Chad Basin area that bans um, four countries, Niger, Nigeria, Cameroon, and Chad, so that they're able to mount attacks in all these separate countries. It's um, crazy. Um, but for me, when I went in May to Borno State where the insurgency actually started, what stood out for me, what has always stood out for me um, in the Boko Haram war is the way that children have been targeted. You see, um, of course, the, the group wants to create an Islamic caliphate and um, establish or purify Islam, as they say, in the north. And nothing, I guess, um, makes them more angry than seeing innocent children, um, you know, learning about Western culture and ideology that really 
I guess, irritates them. I mean, Boko Haram has gone to schools and shot children in their beds. In like, they were sleeping and they shot children in their beds. Um, of course, you know, probably um, they attacked um, uh, Chibok and kidnapped 276 girls in 2015. They've kidnapped quite a number of people over the years, but those were kind of like high profile ones that we got to hear about. Um, when I went in May to Bono State, I went to this school. This is a school, actually. This is one of the schools that was attacked by um, the militants. It was destroyed. But ha I was happy to see that children were playing all around you know, the school. Um, Bono State is slowly coming back to life. But there is no denying the fact that the insurgency has created so much damage. Um, and, and for me, that showed really when I went to report on this story about this um, young man who had been, um, they had escaped Boko Haram territory. Of course, when they were there, they, were, they had to do stuff, right? Um, because Boko Haram kidnaps children, straps strap them with um, suicide vests, and sends them out because um, obviously they're less likely to be detected. About two thirds of their suicide bombing attacks have been with children and with women. And so these children, um, these young men escaped um, Boko Haram territory. Unfortunately, when UNICEF who was working with them tried to get them back into their communities, there was backlash. Um, and Nigeria has always been, well, most of Africa really, um, a place where social connections are so important. And we always say um, a child is raised by the village. And so when I saw villagers, um, Rejecting children, that's when I knew that the damage that Boko Haram has caused for us will, I, I, will take generations to, um, to repair. Um, this young lady, um, she picked up arms and joined the Civilian Joint Task Force, which is helping the military to fight the insurgents um, with local intelligence. And, um, and she did that because her brother was killed in the Boko Haram, by Boko Haram militants. She is also in rehab, like reintegration stage with UNICEF. And they sent her out to learn skills um, so that she could um, earn a living. Another case um, that's interesting and that I covered in Bono State was of these um, two women. Um, see, when the, the insurgency started in 2009, um, the Nigerian military which has always had like a, a military only or garrison only response to the insurgency would go out after a bombing and just like round up young men on the streets and say, well, you look like a Boko Haram element. Why don't you come with us? And so um, since 2009, thousands, we don't know how many, probably 10,000 um, men have disappeared in Bono State. And um, this woman is now leading a, a group that is advocating for the release of these men. Now, to be, to be very truthful, um, the Nigerian military does not have a, a reputation of being like the most disciplined force. And these women, I mean, they're not silly. They know that their sons, um, their, their husbands are probably dead. But they told me, well, we just want the dignity of a response. Um, and, and you can see this woman, actually two of her sons were um, rounded up after one of those attacks. Um, Right now, I'm looking to do more stories about like solutions because it's been 11 years, and where are we heading with this? We don't know. More people are dying. Just um, recently, 89 soldiers were killed in Niger. Um, so I'm, I'm looking. I was asking um, analysts just yesterday about how we can improve the response to Boko Haram, and they were talking about. Um, reintegration and bringing back dialogue, which we, we had that response back in, in the early days of the insurgency, but the Nigerian government botched it and one negotiator was killed. Um, so now they're talking about like, we have to start talking to people again, like understanding, especially local, um, um, locals who know how the group works because when an attack is imminent, um, two villages down, they've probably had intel, like villagers are passing information, like you guys need to get out. And that's kind of how it works. But the, the Nigerian military has not really um, put itself in a place where locals can come forward confidently with information and know that they're safe. Um, so that's kind of where my work is going now. Um, solutions, because this has gone on for too long. Too many people have died. There's too much damage. Um, 
the US is saying that, you know, it's time to pull out um, and reduce like operations in Africa, African countries facing insurgency. And just in case there's a, a policy man in the house, please, that's not the solution, I believe. I think it's time. Um, I mean, ISIS has links with Boko Haram. That says everything, that this now is the time for countries to band together and fight this war together, because it's no more a Nigeria problem. The moment um, um, Boko Haram declared or pledged allegiance to ISIS, it became an all of us problem. And so I think now is the time to um, pull together and kind of fight this war together. And hopefully, I mean, it probably won't end, end soon, but we can start a process that creates conditions for finally um, ending violence in Africa or African countries facing insurgency. And I will stop talking now. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming again and for being here.